Good evening, all. Welcome to Conversations That Count. Thank you all for joining us. We are going slightly earlier than 6 p.m. today because our guest has another appointment at about 6.30. She's a busy lady. She's running for an office. So we're going to try to get as much as we can at this point and let her go by 6.30. I am Shreeli Kapali, Fairfax GOP Vice Chair of Strategy and Engagement. March is Women's History Month. Through conversations that count, Fairfax GOP is celebrating the many achievements of women throughout history in art, athletics, business, politics, government, philanthropy, humanity, science, and education. Women have contributed a lot to the society, and we ourselves have made great strides. Throughout the month of March, I encourage you to join Fairfax GOP in celebrating Women's History Month. Follow us on Twitter and Facebook as we share how our women are contributing to the advancement of communities around us. While we are speaking to our guests, feel free to type in any comments or questions that you might have. In honor of Women's History Month, I have invited a very well-rounded and well-accomplished young lady, Karina Lipsman. Karina is the embodiment of the American dream. Her family immigrated from the former Soviet Union when she was just eight years old. She became Amer an American citizen when she turned 18 and put herself through college at Towson University in just three years and graduated and from John Hopkins. Corina le recently left the defense industry where she spent over a decade in the service of this great nation. During this time, Karina earned her master's too in engineering from John Hopkins University. She recently worked in corporate strategy as well. Karina Lipsman, I am very proud to invite you. You are such a well-rounded and well-accomplished lady. She's a Ukrainian-born US citizen, and now she's running to represent Virginia's eighth congressional district. Karina, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. This is an honor. Karina, I am thrilled that you're part on conversations that count. With the Ukraine-Russian conflict, you're the right person to get some of our unanswered questions answered. Karina, you grew up in Ukraine, then the Soviet Union, then the Soviet Union until you were eight years old. Talk to us about where you grew up in Ukraine, your memories and your journey to United States. Yeah, so I actually was born in Odessa, Ukraine. And uh, it was, Odessa was one of those beautiful cities on the Black Sea that everyone visited. It had 19th century architecture. Uh, during the Soviet Union, there would be a lot of Europeans that would visit it as a resort city. So I had very fond memories growing up. But I will say that coming over to the United States was kind of a terrifying experience, that whole journey, uh, because no one actually prepped me for it. No one said anything about hey, this is where we're going to go live for the rest of your life. They, my mom was just like, oh, we're going to the United States and it's wonderful there. And so being an eight-year-old child, I was just like, okay, great. We're going to go to a new place and it's going to be exciting. And so I didn't really realize what was going to happen. Um, so I remember actually very vividly uh, when we we uh, had to take a train from Odessa to Moscow to catch our flight from um, Moscow to Germany, from Germany then to uh, New York in the US, and then uh, had to have someone pick us up from the New York airport and drive us down to Baltimore where we eventually settled. And I remember going into our little two bedroom apartment and being so excited because when I was living in Odessa, we had a one bedroom apartment, a very, very, very small apartment. And so we lived with um, my grandparents. So it was my mother and my grandparents and I. And so my mother and I shared the small bedroom and my grandparents uh, were basically living in the living room, dining room area. So when we came to America and I explored this little two bedroom apartment, I was like, oh my gosh, this is so great. We have all this room, we have a balcony, we have an outdoor space. So it was just a very exciting um, opportunity to be able to immigrate here at such an early age. 
So Corina, that's a very, very interesting story. I would love to hear more about your mom at certain time. I mean, it takes a lot of guts to kind of leave a country. I'm an immigrant myself. I came here when I was 22. It does take quite a bit of um, um, guts to kind of move your entire family and just come to a different country. So I kudos to your mom for doing that. I mean, she definitely did a great job raising you as well. Thank so uh, Corinna, let me talk a little bit about the war that is going on right now. That's in everyone's mind. Russian officials in any news that uh, you have uh, read, they have repeated the claim that the purpose of their invasion is to bring peace to Ukraine. But the scenes in cities like Odessa that you were talking about and are nothing but peaceful. Do you buy into these claims or do you think uh, anyone else like us should be buying into those claims? Right. So being from Odessa and seeing Odessa as a peaceful city when my family and I left uh, and now seeing the atrocities that are committed against Odessa and the other countries or in the other cities in Ukraine in the name of a violent dictator who wants to control power and to control regions as far as peaceful, I would say this is divisiveness. This is not peace at all. And I can't speak to the motives of Putin, but what I can say is they are not altruistic and they do not have peace in mind when they're attacking these countries. And it's really sad to watch families fighting for their lives, families being misplaced. You see the children, you see the, um, the attacks on hospitals where women are giving birth and already or becoming mothers and watching that and thinking that this is in any way a peaceful invasion I, I mean you would really have to be living in a different world to think that so you know if we actually think about what Putin is trying to accomplish is this reunification of the Soviet Union it's the reunion essentially and the fact of the matter is, if we sit back as a Western nation and let this occur, the problems will reach far beyond the borders of Odessa, of Ukraine. Yeah, uh, so it's, it's, it's just quite evil, Karina. So when people are even talking about in favor of Putin, I just don't know where to start. Uh, I'm like, this is just a human atrocity and just plain evil at this point. So, uh, Karina, I, as an immigrant, I'm always very interested in community engagement. I do work with a lot of minority communities and try to understand their political way of thinking. So this is coming from that angle. So it's my understanding that there are about 350,000 Ukrainian immigrants currently living in the United States. And from my understanding, from what I know about Ukrainian immigrants, you can tell me otherwise, that they have been engaged in politics for a long time. However, I noticed that very few have achieved that high level positions in recent times. I believe she's a Republican, a Ukrainian American Victoria Spart. She's the first Ukrainian born member of the US Congress representing Indiana's fifth district. I've heard her speak. She's a dynamite lady. And next I'm seeing you. So hopefully that dynamism continues. So with the Ukrainian conflict, do you think Ukrainian community will get even more active? And also, is this the time for Ukrainian uh, Americans to think about what is the current political dynamics? Should I continue to vote Republican or Democrat? Or how do they vote? What are their voting patterns? Would love to know a little more about Ukrainian Americans' uh, mindset with politics. Sure. Um, so I can't speak for the entire Ukrainian uh, immigration population, but what I know is that my family, a very hardworking family, we are business minded and we know the compassion of America. We know that immigration is the backbone of America. Immigrants come to America to escape the hardships of their birth countries, of the countries that they currently live in. And whether that oppression is religious oppression, whether it's to seek opportunity and better lives for their children, or knowing that they can live a life that is free of any restrictions and have the ability to become self-sufficient. And 
that's that's the beauty of America. And a lot of times we don't realize how lucky we truly are to have those opportunities to just have the freedom to speak out, to do whatever we want and you know within reason obviously. And so the way that I would govern as a congresswoman, I wouldn't tell people what they can or cannot do but I would empower them through tools and resources that are available to them and create to create those lives that they want and have only dreamed of. And it's not just Ukrainians. I think it's really all of immigrants who want to just go about their lives, pay their taxes, receive a great education and contribute to society. And we need to create those opportunities for immigrants to be able to do so. And so I'd say this, Typically, the first generation of immigrants are the ones who are the most reliant on the government system. So, you know, having having to go through the process of figuring out, you know, how to uh, enroll in school, how to learn the English language. Um, we lived in low income housing, so that was obviously um, government subsidized. We lived um, on food stamps. Obviously, that was a government program. And it was a stepping stone for us to get acclimated and then integrated into the society. And so by the time you know you come to the second and the third generations, you're seeing there's a lot more of those generations that are giving back to the society than the previous generation, the first generations have ever received from the government. So I can't tell you how the immigrant population is going to vote, but I do know that all they really want is that chance to make an honest living for their families, abide by the laws, and be part of this great experiment called America. Corina, you said it so well. And one thing that really stuck to me is um, how different each communities are. When I'm talking about Indian Americans, the first generation is the one that works uh, super hard um, so they understand the value of Americans more than an America and the culture of America. And then I start worrying about second and third generation because you just really, um, again, it's the school colleges that kind of indoctrinate the kids. So it's kind of different to know that uh, as Ukrainian immigrants, when they come here, they kind of rely on government, but then the second and third generations gives back so much more to the country than what their parents even received. It's just really nice to kind of understand each culture. Uh, thank you for helping me understand and clear that out. Uh, so Karina, you work for a defense industry and held some of the highest security clearances within the intelligence community. Uh, you might be able to shed some light on it. Um, despite the administration access to the time, the intelligence, the capabilities, and even the Ukrainian government pleading for help as early as just a couple of days back, the White House did not do much to prevent the least likely scenarios from happening. It happened in Afghanistan, again, least likely scenarios. What do you think went wrong? I mean, just coming from defense background, what can you kind of help us figure that part out? Right, and so um, thank you for that question because it's a really important question and I've covered it with Fox News, I've covered it with Daily Caller, I've covered it with a lot of uh, news outlets because you know, people were just wondering what could we have done to prevent all of this from happening? And you know, when you're when you're sitting in the intelligence community, when you're sitting in the defense community, you have access to things that your average American um, doesn't have just because of the classifications. And so, um, but I didn't think that the American person needed to even have those classifications to see what was gonna happen. Because if you look back to when, it, when, um, when Georgia was uh, attacked, when it was invaded in 2008, that was the first chess piece. Then you had Crimea in 2014, that was the second chess piece. And so we could have kind of predicted as a nation without even having that intelligence that something else was gonna happen because Putin really wanted to recreate the Soviet Union. And the Biden administration ran their campaign on the fact that President Biden 
was this foreign policy guru. This is what he's built his career on. And he was so savvy in it. And they knew exactly what was happening. We saw all the Russian troops amassing at the border for weeks, maybe even months. And our intelligence showed that Putin was going to attack. So why did we wait to put the pressure on American companies to pull out of Russia? Why did we wait to arm our friends in Poland and Germany and other countries with the necessary armament to push into Ukraine to give them a fighting chance? There's no reason we should have been sitting on the sidelines so long without giving them the proper equipment to defend themselves. And the reality of the situation is that we would have been, we would have acted sooner if Biden didn't wait so long and we could have amassed a global force that showed our true commitment to the people of Ukraine against the bully like Putin. And so we waited, we sat by the sidelines and we tried to gain yardage after we were already losing the battle. And it's great that certain companies are just now starting to make moves to enact sanctions and abide by them and pull out of Russia. But we did that too little too late. We should have been lobbying those companies. We should have been putting more severe sanctions on Russia to move their troops before they invaded. And so, you know, we've pressured, we're now being pressured by the woke activists to make those decisions. They're in, a, in the best interest of the corporate bottom line and not in the best interest of the people of Ukraine. Absolutely, Karina. I think you made so many good points. Uh, yeah, I'm glad you rem you remembered and you reminded all of us that Biden did run on foreign global policy export, and time and time and time again, he's made blunders throughout. So at this point, it makes me it's very disappointing. Uh, because at the end of the day, regardless of who is in the White House, I want them to succeed because only if they succeed, America succeed. So this is kind of quite disappointing to me at every level. Uh, so Karina, I do want to go back to that immigrants. I think you said something really, uh, something that uh, I, I really want to emphasize on. The integration of Americans or immigrants to our society strengthens America. You said that in your previous answer. So do you think instead of uh, encouraging illegal immigration and taking on additional burden on our border, we need to invest in programs that enable our own immigrants that are already here legally to better integrate and become contributing members of our society sooner than wait until second and third generation kicks in. What do you think and how do, you, how do we make that happen? Right, uh, this country was founded on immigration or immigrants, right? The, everyone that came to this country, aside from the indigenous people were immigrants. And this is how the country was built. And that is something that we should be proud of and we should not take for granted. However, we must also face the realization that drug trafficking, sex trafficking and human migration across our Southern border is a problem. And we should be arming our customs and border protection agents with the tools they need to enforce the laws. We have 21st century technology that we're able to use. You're able to you know, use a lot of this stuff. You're already using it as a, as a, in your daily lives. You go to the airport, they scan your face to make sure that you, know, you check off that you're the correct person. So we have all of those tools in place. It's just a matter of using them at the border. And that being said, we must also provide a stable and clear uh, um, and legal path to immigration. So just like many immigrants have come here and acclimated to the culture, they learn English, right? That's, that's the number one thing. They learn English, they assimilate to the culture, they assimilate to what America is because they ultimately came to America and prospered with the opportunities that America has to offer. So we need to ensure that it is easy for legal, I'll stress that again, legal immigrants to be able to get to a point where it's not a cumbersome process. And I think I mentioned before, when we first immigrated here, my mother had to figure out how to enroll me in the school system. 
Well, someone who's just coming here, having to uh, uproot her entire family, come to a country, figure out where she's going to live, how she's going to learn the language, where she's going to work, how she's going to raise her child, how she's going to integrate her child into the American culture. How is she supposed to figure out, okay, I need to go and enroll her in school. So I need to talk to so-and-so. And then I need to be able to get around. So I need to get a driver's license. So then I can drive a car or I need to apply for financial aid because my child is going to college or whatever it is. And it could be the smallest, simplest thing that, you know, you and I kind of just take for granted in a sense um, of, well, we just look it up online or we just call this agency or we just do that. An immigrant who doesn't really understand our process is not going to know that right away. And so by providing them those resources and those tools so they can in integrate into society quicker, easier, that ultimately benefits us as a society because those same people are now creating businesses. They're paying their taxes. They're part of our workforce and they're contributing members of society and, and well-adjusted members of society. And so we need to ensure that we're providing these tools to them so they can make life easier for themselves, their families, and again, integrate into our society a lot faster than having to go through a process that's arduous, that's cumbersome, that is just not an easy process for anyone to maneuver. Sometimes even the, uh, the folks that have lived here for a while, because you think about the, you know, going to the DMV sometimes, right? Just to get your license renewed and they send you back and they're like, oh, you didn't fill out this paperwork, come back tomorrow. And so now you have to take a day off and come back tomorrow and bring in the proper paperwork. So again, I just think it, it, it could be a lot more streamlined. We have the tools to do it. We don't need to spend extra money on it, but we just need to be mindful about how we're implementing these things, how we're rolling this out and how we're helping people. So Corina, you articulated on behalf of all first generation immigrants really well. I think the things that we take it for granted are not so easy when you're kind of literally starting out. And one thing that I've always encouraged, uh, either it is Fairfax uh, uh, County Republican Committee or for any GOP for that matter, is to kind of engage the community in what they want, uh, right? Uh, like first generation immigrants, like helping them take citizenship tests, uh, making sure you invite them into your headquarters and talk about all the things that you just like life-saving things. Uh, how do you enroll your child into school? How do you apply for driver's ID? How do you get your food stamps just to get your life started? Uh, I mean, things such as that, which are extremely meaningful. And I think that's what, uh, when I call it as inclusivity, embracing means. Inclusivity and embracing doesn't mean that uh, we have to be inclusive of all races, color, creed. We need to do all of that. But inclusivity in my eyes is, what do the community really want? How do we cater to the community to get them on board so we are providing them equal opportunity? Uh, Corina, you said it very well. I couldn't have told, uh, articulated it better. So Corina, in the beginning of the show, I did tell you that we do this Facebook Live. So we have one of our viewer, uh, Roku uh, Benevento, I'm, I apologize if I'm not saying the name right, has a question for you that I would love for you to answer. His question is, are you willing to speak out against these men claiming to be women and cheating at sports, thereby hurting women's chances and opportunities for success at the sports that they've worked so hard to be at an excellent at? I, I, you know, things like this kind of make your blood boil sometimes um, because we as women especially have strived so hard to have equal opportunities and have the opportunities that we have today and the freedoms that we have today, we, we have struggled so hard and we fought for those. And now to introduce things like this into sports um, where you're allowing men who are calling themselves women or identifying as women rather, having them compete against women who have fought to be there, I do not think that's fair. And I will fight whatever, however I can to ensure that all women have the proper chance to 
um, compete fairly, uh, make sure that their rights are protected and make sure that we're not creating the society where women now have to feel like a second class citizen again and have to refight for the freedoms that we have fought for for so long. Absolutely, Corina. That's a great answer. And I think it is the right answer, right thing to do. I have a daughter myself uh, and I have a son too. So I, I, I kind of resonate to any that, that what you said. Corina, you are one of the candidates that's running for Congress in Virginia's 8th eight, eight, Congressional District. It includes Arlington County, Alexandria City, Falls Church City, as well as Fairfax County. Uh, the reason I kind of relate to all of those um, uh, cities is not many Republicans have ever won in, the, in that particular congressional districts, neither any parts of those um, counties. What motivated you to run and why now? Yeah, um, well, we've seen it with Glenn Youngkin, right? We've seen that Virginia wants change. And I think you're slowly gonna start seeing more of that change going to Northern Virginia, and which includes the 8th district and the 10th district and the 11th district, because Glenn made it okay to be a Republican again. Glenn allowed the Democrats and the independents and the moderates to look at the Republican party and say, huh, I can identify with that. And I don't have to be scared to speak up and vote Republican. So in the eighth district specifically, this seat has not been held by a Republican since the Ronald Reagan administration. So it's been quite a while. It's also never been held by a woman since its inception. So if we get into Congress, this will be a uh, quite an achievement on a lot of accounts. And you know, I'm going to go back to uh, to how the Democrats want to run Northern Virginia into being like Baltimore City. And I grew, in Baltimore, grew up in Baltimore City. And I went to public school in Baltimore City. And I absolutely do not want to see Northern Virginia become Baltimore City. And so that's why I decided to run. And I ask myself every single day why I left my job in corporate strategy, why I left my job in defense and intelligence sector to run full time. And some people look at me and they're like, you're, you're looking to get on this you know, this, this mission of, you know, just going down a hole. And I was just like, you know what? Yes, but if we do not run, if we do not fight, how are we ever going to win? We're just allowing the same people to keep, uh, to keep their jobs, right? The incumbents to keep their jobs without having to work for it, without having to talk to the people without having to fight for those elected, uh, for, for the, uh, fight for the constituents who they should be fighting for because those are the same people that elected them into office because they're the, um, the elected officials should be representing the people, the people's interests, the people's voices, not their own interests, not the party's interests. And so I'm running because I want I know what real oppression looks like. I know what real oppression feels like. I know what it's like to sit there and watch the city that you grew up in being bombed, attacked, annihilated by an oppressor. And I feel like a conserv with my conservative values, they're being attacked as well. They're being annihilated by an oppressor. And that oppressor is not Putin. It's the Democratic Party and corporate America. And I feel every time I turn on the news and they talk about, oh, gas prices are because of Putin. Oh, inflation in grocery stores, supply chain issues because of Putin. They're not a result of Putin, but the result of an oppressive regime in the United States that is subservient upon their pollsters and their numbers versus working for the American people. I know what an oppressive regime looks like. I've lived through it in the Soviet Union, Ukraine. And I don't want to go through that again. I don't want the American people to go through that again. So that's why I'm running for Congress. 
Corina, you have such well thought out answers. Uh, this is, uh, I, I feel like almost uh, sitting here and just applauding for every sentence you just spoke. Um, I, I, again, fair, fair Facebook Live, we've had multiple questions come through. I would request that if we can get to all the questions, I would request you to take some time, get on our live, uh, Facebook page and answer some of those questions. They're very genuine uh, questions. One, uh, one of the viewers is asking, what do you feel are the local issues in District 8 that are excited to begin that are excited for you to begin addressing. That's coming from Chris. Uh, I think the biggest thing is education, right? We've seen that with Glenn Youngkin. We've seen education and the power of education. I went through the public school system in Baltimore City and I keep bringing up Baltimore City, but I feel like it's really important because if you look at the numbers of illiteracy, if you look at how the kids in Baltimore City are taught today, it's atrocious. And I think everything starts with education. It's an ecosystem, right? Because when you're focusing on education and making sure that the standards are high, making sure that we're teaching uh, kids the skill sets that they need to survive once they leave uh, high school, once they leave college, wherever they decide to go on next, we want to equip them so they can live in the real world and survive. And so education is at the forefront. And it ties into every single other aspect of our lives. It ties into the workforce and how they're going to contribute into our workforce. It ties into their family values. It ties into how they uh, contribute into the community, how they, how they participate in the community. It ties into the economy. It ties into all of these things. And so having that strong educational system that doesn't necessarily get lowered because we're trying to be inclusive or we're trying to do this or we're trying to do that. No, you're doing a disservice to the children. You're doing a disservice to the society. And we're not creating the next generation of leaders. And that's what school should be focused on is ensuring that we're creating the next generation of leaders who are equipped to lead and to serve and to be contributing members of our society. Very well said, Corina. Education is the key. As a mom, my kids go to Fairfax County Public Schools. I'm in the school board meetings very often, <laughs> whether they like it or not, speaking out against uh, downgrading our education system. There are questions about CRT. There is a question about uh, Ukrainian conflict. What would be your um, uh, your uh, your ideal solution to the crisis. We may not be able to get to all of that because of your time limitation today, but I would uh, sincerely encourage you to go back and try to answer our viewers. Those are very good questions. Corina, uh, as we are coming to the end, this is Women's History Month and uh, you are such an accomplished and undoubtedly um, I will uh, I will probably compliment your mom for me for making who you are. I hope she gets to watch this. Other than your mom, tell me. I would love to know from you who is there another women leader that you look up to. Is there another women leader that you look up to? So I look up to all the women. I find all women to be incredible human beings. The fact that we can be strong, resilient, powerful funny, intelligent, loving, caring, nurturing, all women, to me personally, I, I, I can't just choose one, okay? I've chosen my mother because she's the one that brought me into this world. She's the one that made the ultimate sacrifice to uproot our family from the Soviet Union and come here um, for a better life for me. But I, I just... I think all women have a unique place in our hearts and they touch us in very different ways. Um, you know, from your, from your caretakers, to your teachers, to your friends, to your colleagues, to your neighbors and friends, women should be empowered and should be celebrated on a daily basis, not just one month. And throughout the years on this earth, I've had the opportunity to witness how special women really are. And me included in that. Um, I, I, I hope that I'm a good friend. I hope that I'm a good daughter and I hope that I'm a good colleague. Um, and, and I just, I, I value that so much that we're able to, as a, as a gender, to, to just have all of those characteristics and just flow through life the way that we do. 
Corinna, I always get motivated when women take the time to self be self-reflective and self-compliment too. I, I really enjoy that. More often than not, I think women are very good at uh, throwing accolades to everyone, want to fit in. But just the moment of the 10 seconds moment where you took time to compliment yourself tells how confident you are. And that's very, very important for all women. So Corina, this has become very short, but hey, we are coming to the end of the program. Please take that last couple of minutes to talk about anything that I missed. I'm sure due to our time limitations, I didn't get into too detail about the issues that you want to in your campaign, but this is your time. Please take two minutes and talk about what you think you, uh, what should be the, your closing remarks for our viewers. Sure. Uh, thank you again. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, this has been a lot of fun. I appreciate everyone that has tuned into, um, into this live session and all the great questions. I will try to get to all the questions uh, as soon as I can, I promise. Um, but I encourage people to learn more about the campaign and support my candidacy by visiting Karina, K-A-R-I-N-A, -A, for forcongress.com. And that's my website. And I have my issues on there. I have my contact information on there, a little bit about me. Uh, you can see the, the photos of my mom and I from uh, the, <laughs> the Soviet Union. Um, and I just, I, I encourage people to really take a look at the candidates and make sure that when you're making the decision, think about who will represent you best in Congress and who's going to take your voice and take that with them and make sure that it's heard. And I fought my whole entire life against the odds. And I think, you know, having grown up in a Soviet era Ukraine, coming here, living in Baltimore City, uh, going to public school, and then being able to achieve what I've achieved, I think I've ultimately live the American dream. And I want to make sure all of um, our constituents and all of Americans have that opportunity as well. So thank you again for your time. I really appreciate it. And um, hopefully we'll talk again soon. Lorena, thank you so much for joining by taking the time out of your busy campaign season. We appreciate you. I appreciate you. And I hope you're successful in securing the nomination in our upcoming primaries. I will take this opportunity to uh, thank our viewers for being so active participants of this um, program. And I'm sure Karina will get to all the answers very quickly as soon as she possibly can. So viewers, I am thrilled to announce that we are going to have our own Lieutenant Governor of Virginia coming to our conversations that count on Monday, March 21st at 6 p.m. I hope all of you choose to tune in, like the show, put in the questions. I'll take as many questions as possible and uh, talk to our Lieutenant Governor. Um, that also being said, I also would like to take a moment to talk about a couple of more important events. Fairfax GOP is very committed to spreading the message of life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness within our immigrant and minority communities. Uh, for that uh, reason, I will be hosting a meeting tomorrow, which is Saturday from 1 to 2 p.m. If you are interested in attending, please message here, and I will send you further details about the venue. Also, Fairfax GOP is hosting a fundraiser on Tuesday, April 5th. Tom Cotton will be our congressman. Tom Cotton will be our special guest. If you would like to attend and support the fundraiser so Fairfax GOP can continue to do this great work, please message and we will send you the venue information as well. Last but not the least, Victoria Cobb, President of Family Foundation of Virginia will be with us next Friday, March 25th at 5 p.m. The flyers and the rest of the postings will happen on Facebook page. So please continue to tune in, like our shows if you can, and if you can share them, more viewers and more listeners can listen to this. Thank you for your ongoing support of Conversations That Count. Please support by sharing this video far and wide. God bless you all. God bless America. And I will see you next. I will see you on Monday with Lieutenant Governor Vincent Sears at 6 p.m. Thank you again. Have a wonderful evening.